old school bodybuilding clothing company. If it's been three and a half hours since you last ate protein, and now you're starting to freak out, you are old school. If watching someone sit on a hammer machine for five minutes between sets playing with their phone pisses you off, you are definitely old school. OSBBC.com for the hardest training athletes. I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's guest is the world's strongest bench presser of all time. He does it raw. Doesn't get much better than that. Let me welcome Julius Maddox to the show. What's up, my friend? What's up, brother? How are you? I almost made you too too small. You're you're, you're certainly not small (laughs) by any means. (laughs) You know, the the raw bench press record has got to be the purest lift in all of powerlifting because everyone always wants to know, like I I went through this when I was bodybuilding, what do you bench? What do you bench? You actually can tell people I bench the most of anyone else in the history of humanity. And you do it without equipment on, which is amazing. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, um, people don't believe me when I say it, you know, (laughs) so they walk right into the question. I mean, they ask me the question, they walk right into the answer and They, they typically don't believe me, and I'm just like, look, you can Google it or something. And I'm and sure there's, there's always someone that tells you that, they're, that their uncle used to bench press 1,000 pounds or 900 pounds or something like that when he absolutely. was Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I hear it all the time. I hear about people's uncles, um, you know, that are in prison that <laughs> have been lifting for 48 <laughs> years, and they're still – they're the world record holders in the uh, yeah. correction correctional facilities across yeah. the nation. You just hear it all all the time, man. I get a kick out of it. Yeah, it's funny because you know I used to hear the same stuff. People would be like, you know, I my uncle used to be bigger than you, and this is when I was like three hundred something pounds, you know, back in the day. So now I just want I'm going to pull up this bench press that you did because uh, on your Instagram, this was uh, seven hundred eighty two pounds and. It's so impressive because you can see the weight on the bar. When you lower this bar onto your chest, it goes down pretty quick. Whereas, and then you just press it up. It looked like like it was easy. Like you could have you had another thirty pounds in you almost. Yeah, uh, eight hundred was definitely there that day. Yeah, um, you know, I'm just you know we got a, a bigger picture that's in store, and uh, it was just I don't know. It's it's crazy because. Yeah. The thought process in my head is, good gosh, this weight is heavy. You know what? <laughs> but, you know, when you watch the equipped guys, and this is nothing against them, I love those guys. They have to actually pull the weight down to their chest. You actually can see how heavy that weight is because you're a strong guy, and that weight came down pretty fast you know, on you. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, I don't want to exert too much energy coming down. Sure. Uh, but I used to do it really fast and it created almost like a whip. So it would kind of work against me. Right. Um, you, if you timed it right, it could work for you, but I just got tired of people always trying to dispute my lifts. So gotcha. I really worked on controlling the weight and, uh, making sure I didn't allow it to sink in and just kind of, you know, found my own pace, you know what I mean? And it, that's kind of the, 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 where I've really found, um, the the mechanics uh, for me that make me feel comfortable and and align with you know uh, being able to press the weight because it's it's believe it or not some people think it's like I just just brute strength like I just basically bounce it off my chest but that's that's oh, right. not the case no you could I could tell you're not bouncing that you kill yourself if you did that anyway now, oh, interestingly when you first started the first time you ever bench pressed like how strong were you like when you didn't know anything what you were doing you just got under a bar. Uh, I think in high school, I bench pressed like two seventy five. Okay, so uh, you was, weren't like crazy strong then. No, that, that was my that was my junior year. In fact, in high school, they didn't really. So I played basketball. I started varsity from the end of my freshman year all the way through my junior year. Oh wow! Uh, 
Yeah, and they didn't really want me. And basketball was the sport. That was that was the sport that I had a heart for. But right. they didn't really want me lifting weights because I was getting too strong too fast. <laughs> so how, I was how, much, how tall are you, by the way? I'm six three. Okay, so you're you a good you're a good height for basketball. Yeah, yeah. I was a big center. Plus, I was very athletic. I could move. And uh, I would go up for a layup sometimes, and I would completely miss the whole rim, you know. <laughs> I mean, completely just miss, you know, just blow it away. And, uh, Did you ever pull a backboard down like like Shaquille? Listen, they would tell me to – so once I, once I was able to dunk a basketball, yeah, they would tell me to stop because literally <laughs> whether, I made the, whether I made the dunk or I missed it, I made it look good whenever I was going up. But literally <laughs> – uh, the, we had these uh, college um, level basketball where we played at one of the local college teams played at, and um, literally they would think that I was getting ready to pull the rim down. But that's how hard I would slam it, you know. And uh, people, you know, people don't believe me until other people were like, "Man, I remember in high school when heck you could dunk a basketball." And yeah, you know, it's just one of those things that that man. To be honest, I was just a lost talent for real. I wasted it away, man. Oh really? So you, you didn't even nurture that talent? What? Now, why not? What happened? So I mean, drugs and girls, you know, partying. Really? I didn't even know that about you, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, man. Just to be honest, like, and this may re, this may apply. I mean, I think it applies to just about everybody. But you know, f for a long time, for me, um, just a struggle with identity crisis. Didn't know who I was. Wasn't confident who and who I was. So. With that, with that miss, um, missing piece and, and lost identity, you know, you kind of gravitate to whatever everyone else is doing. Right. So I'm a little bit of everything. So with that being said, um, things that made me feel good or gave me some kind of notoriety, um, I gravitated to. So I remember my freshman year, because I was up and coming and the, the hype was so big about Julius Matt explaining sports. Yeah. Um, you know, I partied with the varsity guys, whether basketball uh, uh, or football or track, you know, and I remember going to a party my first my freshman year, like my first real high school party. Yeah. And you're probably like what, like 15 at that point? Yeah. The, yeah. I was 15, but I looked like I was 17. <laughs> and I wanted to fit in so bad because that's what I desired. We all desire some type sure. of fellowship. Right. And validation. Yeah. Relationship, man. And. You know, they, they were drinking and I just had a drink, you know, and yeah. kind of that's where it started, just like socially, just to make sure I fit in and, and I'm a part of the group. And then it just became a lifestyle. And my that's that's kind of how I walked off the football field. My my junior year was there was a pool party leading into my senior summer. Uh, I mean, leading into the senior year. And I was like, man, I don't, this is my last basically my last high school summer. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to miss this pool party. So we're having three a day practices. Right. And um, the coach told me, he said, um, I got into an argument with one of the players on purpose just to, for the coach to send me home is what I thought he was going to do. So <laughs> yeah, I had it planned, you know, and everything always makes sense in my head, <laughs> but as it, you know, comes to revelation, it never works out the way I plan it, you know? No. And uh, he kicked me out. So we had this fence that surrounded the football field. And he said, go outside the fence and sit down. And instead, I started walking towards the locker room. And he told right. me, he said, uh, Max, if you keep walking, you're not playing for this football team. Don't come back. And wow. I was like, yeah, right. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, yeah, right. I'm Julius. I can do what I want. Right. You're the star of the team. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And uh, you know what? I tried to come back. Maybe I think school school started about three weeks later. Right. And I tried to come back. Like some of the players were like, look, man, you need to go talk to coach and get back on the team. Like, right. We need you out here this year. This is your shot. It was my senior year. And I'm like, I knew since I was a little kid, I wanted to go to the NFL. That was my, that was right. my dream. Did you have scholarship offers at that point? Oh, I, so UK had come to visit me my junior year, um, Western Kentucky University and Louisville. And Louisville was hot during that time. Mm -hmm. Louisville, Kentucky, um, yeah. the you know Louisville University, yep. but um, they were very during that time they were really they had a really good program, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and, and that kind of probably fed into it. Uh, also, it was just like look who I am, you know, as far as you know these people showing interest already, mm -hmm. and um, and I know that partly uh, later to come to find out, like part of it was um, the coach at the time. 
had relations with some of these uh, college football coaches. So he was just oh. doing his job of reaching out and they were interested anyway. Sure. But um, I was just like, look, you know, um, I went to the locker room one morning and he was sitting in his office and, uh, I, you know, basically put my pride aside and I asked him, I said, hey, I'm sorry. Can I come back and play? I'll do whatever it takes. Sure. And he looked me right in the face and said, no, you'll never play football for Owensboro High School again. No, get wow. Out of my really? Yeah, he said, I'm going to make an example out of you. And um, basically uh, kicked me out of that office and, and told me to never come back. And, and that's what happened. So basically the next 10 years, really, I blamed him and a couple other things for the way I turned out. You know? Wow. He, that was a pretty bold move on his part to, to do that. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, he had only been there for two years. He was coming mm -hmm. in to try to change the program up. So right. he was basically trying to make a statement. And, um, and, you know, like once I quit, a few other people quit. And it just kind of trickled down. And he's like, look, you know, we're going to get rid of these toxic players. And, and basically that's what happened. And Wow. It was just senior year. At that point, he should have just <laughs> sucked it I know, up. Well, and that's – uh, when you again, whenever you are in a mindset that everybody owes you something, yeah, and you don't have positive role, like there, there's, there's, it's good to have positive role models. I had positive mm -hmm. role models, but I didn't have that. My dad wasn't that figure to where he basically made me do what I had to do. Right. It was one of them things like, ah, I mean, you do what you do, you learn if you. If, you know, you're gonna learn if you if you if whatever mistakes you make, you're gonna learn from them. You know, right? So he wasn't the kind of he wasn't the kind of father that would go down there and talk to the coach. You know, no, I mean he just he didn't. I mean, you know, he was battling with his own um, uh, battles. You know, my dad was addicted to you know uh, alcoholism and, and oh wow crack okay. cocaine. So um, he just had you know his own demons that he were fighting. You know, so wow. um, that was you know, one of the other issues that I had, you know, growing up and why I kind of turned the way that, and went down the direction I went, you know? Mm. So here you are, you're this natural gifted athlete. You're playing basketball, football, track and field, and you're probably the best at all of it. And you're not even giving probably a hundred percent of yourself to it. Right. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, absolutely. I would only, I would only push myself just to, get by just to get done with practice right. just Which, to right and you know it was the mindset you don't understand and, and that's what the, the i call it the paradigm shift and as far as in my training what happened in 2015 is where the switch flipped but you only i didn't see past today i didn't yeah. never seen the future because i never had anybody show me the vision of saying this is what you could have you could have right. this one and i just never seen it i never seen it uh, happen for me so um, I only, like I said, I only pursued things that made me feel good. And I knew that this party that I was going to, uh, was going to make me feel good. This party, I mean, you know, with the girls and drinking and, and instant you know, gratification and, type of, thing. absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of, um, where it started when I opened that door that day. I, I have to imagine though, when you're that gifted, okay, naturally, and you knew, obviously you wanted to go to the NFL or NBA or whatever, you know, you, you, wherever you were seeing yourself going, you had to, I mean, there had to be a, a little bit of sour rapes you know, when you see guys that were less talented than you making it, you know, going to college on scholarship and going to the NFL was, did, did that make you bitter for a while? Absolutely. 10 years. I mean, I, it's crazy because I can tell you exactly how long it's, uh, mm. It, even after you know I got clean and 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 was on the straight and narrow, just put it this way, um, I could not even even if I see so say I was somewhere and I seen a football, people throwing a football, right. or driving by the high school to see the the football stadium. Anytime I seen anything like even watching NFL games on on TV, mm. it reminded me of how big uh, of a failure I was that I basically threw my life down the drain because I wanted to party. So you would think a person would kind of go a different direction, but I indulged in those things even more. What did you weigh in high school? Like I said, I was anywhere from 300 to 305, 310, somewhere around. That, that's which I find incredible because you were playing basketball at that weight too. And you were, and you, and you, you told me what was your, your 40 time, like four, eight or something a like four, that? Four, eight, six. That's crazy. 
That oh, it was, I mean, it was, it was nuts. I was the type of guy, I could, I could be at a basketball game, believe it or not, and I would get a rebound, and I would go from one end to the other other side of the court and, and, and score the ball, literally, <laughs> and it would blow people's minds. <laughs> I, I would, i got to be honest with you, look, you know, I was a tough kid in, in high school, but if I ever got hit by you, like on a football field, you, I mean, you were probably punishing people that were getting hit by you, and you were a running back, just running through people. Yeah. I'm sure where you're yeah. hurting people. I love the the first. It was funny because uh, people would, you know, from from middle even through middle school. That's what I did. I, I I ran the football, but man, the first time I touched the the football in a varsity basketball, I mean, a varsity football game. Yeah, uh, my first touch was like a 26 yard run. Literally <laughs> ran over like six people. <laughs> And then the people people were just blown away. They were just blown away. And uh, Crazy. you know the you know we changed coaches at the end of that year. The coach yeah. left, and then this new coach came in and tried to change the whole program, which caused friction between the players. And that's just mm. kind of the route that it went. But you know, I thought that I could balance both. I thought that I could, you know, do the you know do this thing where you you're yeah. you're in and out of relationships and you're partying and you're doing all this stuff sure. and be an athlete and my junior year, everything, it seems like that summer, uh, it, it everything caught up with me. I went from starting varsity basketball to being actually the sixth man. Wow. Year, no football. Track um, and shot put, I made it to state, but I only placed like sixth place. So you, um, you, people were before. passing you because they were working harder than you, basically. They were working, absolutely. I mean, I would show up to a track meet and some, and some, um, some flippers and 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 some shorts and a t you know a tank top and I just didn't I didn't apply myself I thought it was a game you know I just yeah, thought everything yeah. was a joke yeah and uh, because I would do this I would show up um, and, and and some house shoes or some or, or whatever you just I would show up and just basically uh, um, uh, uh, nighttime attire however you want to put it but anyway and people would just uh, and I would win. I would win track events, <laughs> whether throwing the disc. Yeah. There was a few times where I won, and they disqualified me because I had on house shoes. I like slippers. Yeah, like literally slippers. <laughs> you know, it, you must look back and say to yourself, God knows what I could have done if I ever applied myself and gave 100. Like what you're doing now with bench pressing, which we're going to talk about in a minute. You would have applied yourself like that. Just, not even forget basketball and, and football. Just to track and field, you probably would have gone to the Olympics, you know? Yeah, uh, but again, man, that's the crazy thing about it. Uh, for years, for you, I, trust me, I have, I've had plenty of time to sit down yeah. and look back through my life and think, like, man, I wasted so much time and potential yeah. um, that I could have done, you know, whatever I wanted to set my mind to, you know, right. but – I decided to be the class clown. I decided to, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. Man. No, I, I look. I, I feel for you because you 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 gave up a lot of opportunities and um, absolutely. You now, you ever think back? Because you're only 33. I mean, obviously, you, you're not going to be playing NFL football now. But do you ever think about like um like throwing the discus? Like you ever try to like maybe? I, I know obviously bench pressing is a priority now for you, but I mean, I I still believe you probably could probably be a great discus thrower. You know. Yeah, I think so. I think I'd be more equipped for shot put. Just or shot, or even shot put right now, especially since you're so big, right? Yeah, if they gave me a shot, you know, absolutely. So, and that's later on getting into the story. It, that's kind of the the gist of it is, um, I refuse to let any other opportunity go by. Now that I've I've experienced it and I've been in a season where I had nothing and I didn't have much, that um, I will do whatever any opportunity I get. Smart, it's reasonable. I will take the chance. That's great. Do you? Um, how did you find out that you were a, a naturally gifted bench presser? Well, interesting. Uh, this is an interesting story. I was actually in um, a drug treatment facility whenever I found out. Um, you know, found my gift. And uh, at this point in time, this is 2013. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm finally working a job for the first time in my life. And, you know, for being on drug from being on drugs for so long and abusing different substances, uh, you know, I just kind of, I didn't, I never felt complete. I didn't just, I just didn't feel right. Always, what was the drugs you were using? Uh, whatever you want to call whatever name, Xanax, uh, 
uh, liquid Lord Sab, uh, marijuana, um, right. ecstasy. Wow. Uh, okay. Basically, whatever you know, whatever I can get my hands. You would on. party. You would party. You would go out and party. I just party. But my favorite drugs were like ecstasy, like MDMA and yeah, and Zen Xanax and MDMA were just every day. I was either on one or the other. Oh, real? So you were doing ecstasy every day? Wow, I never heard that. Before. Oh yeah, there, there went. I remember weeks where I would I would be tripping ecstasy for you know three days in a row rest up and then go back and do it again, you know, because wow. there comes a point to where your body quits responding. Yeah. The so, serotonin runs out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. I would rest just along, just long enough to where my body would allow me to, um, feel it again, to, yeah. to, to allow me to feel it again. So I would, I would use Xanax to basically come down Xanax, mm -hmm. triple C's. You ever heard of triple C's? What are triple course, C's? Triple C's is a, um, a cough suppressant. It's core seeding code and cough. So uh, what they did was they changed uh, they changed the chemical makeup of the pill. Now you can't trip off of it, but if you took, <laughs> yeah, if you took anywhere from twelve to twenty of these little red pills, right, uh, you would go on a trip for about ten hours. Oh wow, I didn't even know that. Wow. Oh, absolutely. and you could just go to a Walgreens or or basically it's a poor man's drug. If you if you couldn't find any drugs in the city, then we would go trip on Corsi and Coke and cough. So it'd be like maybe like ten of us, and we're all tripping. Every single one. Wow, of and, and I never even heard of that. I'm, I'm I learned oh, something new. So you, so you're on everything basically. So how did you get to rehab? What did you hit rock bottom? Yeah, absolutely, multiple times. Um, the first time I got busted for trafficking, uh, uh, trafficking marijuana in a school zone, that was in 2011. Tried to get it together, um, end up getting a lesser sentence for my my case um, due to some some. Uh, laws that they changed in Kentucky for marijuana, mm -hmm. and um, basically it was a slap on the wrist, and I was back doing the same things that I was wow. doing. And it's crazy because at that time I found out I had, like my wife, my now wife, she was my girlfriend then, that she was pregnant and getting ready to have a baby. Oh wow! And uh, so I tried to get a job, I tried to do the right thing, but as soon as uh, they let me off the hook on probation and dismissed my felonies, I was you know back out to selling drugs and using drugs again. Yeah, well, that that's until you hit. You, so you never really hit rock bottom at that point. At that point, I didn't. And then a year, a year and a half later, I got busted for trafficking prescription pills and uh, marijuana through U.S. Postal Services. And Ugh. that was the time where it basically shattered everything. There was no, right, right. I couldn't get my lawyer to get me out of jail. There was no bonding out. Um, you know, I was there to stay. And. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. It was just, uh, it was, it was a time for me to sit down and, and, and be still. See, where does the bench press come in at this? Was there at the rehab facility? Was there a, a gym? Yep. So uh, I was in jail for a while. Um, and then I could either, I, I caught two, so much charges were two five year prison sentences for each uh, offense. Ooh. Wow. And, uh, either I had an opportunity to go get, go to long-term treatment, in-house treatment, or I could serve my time, which would have been maybe like a year and a half, and I would have been out. Or I could have did uh, three years at a treatment facility, and I chose to do the three years at the treatment facility because I was going to be able to get out and actually see my kids. Right. And um, I, I wanted to change. The change already started to ha happen in mm. jail. Um, I'm a huge, I'm huge in my faith, and um, at this point in time is when I cried out to God, and, and things started to look really different and my heart started to change i no longer cared about selling drugs and driving the baddest cars and having right. the baddest girls i just cared about getting out and being a father to my kids and uh awesome. went, went to this christ center recovery program and like i said um holding a job for the first time in my life and and facing myself and dealing with some issues in the past it just really made me pressed out because i started to realize all the opportunities that I passed and sure. all the relationships and bridges that I burned. And um, I would just go every day. Um, I would get off work and the treatment facility I was at is a, um, it's a 100, these houses are a little over a hundred years old, but they've been remodeled for um, sure. community living. Mm -hmm. But the basements are uh, basically dirt floors. That's how old these houses are. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But someone had donated a bench, a bar, and a bunch of old steel. And uh, cool. so what I would do every single day, I would go, I would get off work, 
um, and basically go to this gym and start doing, you know, workouts. And I didn't know right. what I was doing. I just did bench press, stuff that you <laughs> learn in high school. Right, right. Uh, but the ceilings in, in this facility were only like, I want to say, eight foot. In the oh, my room. God. And so there wasn't a lot of room. So what I would do was <laughs> I would do seated overhead press. Yeah. I would do bench press, um, three sets of 135, um, overhead press, curls, and then bent over rows. And I did those every single day. Every right. single, I mean, every, just about five to six days a week. <laughs> and you probably grew from it, too. <laughs> oh, the same routine. The same routine every <laughs> single day. Just because it made me feel good. And sure. I got that pump. And it yeah. made, so, so when I got that pump, I felt like I was achieving something. I felt right. good about myself and started to become spiritually, physically, and mentally, um, uh, you know, leveled out. And one day we were down and, and the most I had ever got worked up to was 275 mm -hmm. because I've, I've never really been above 275. Right. And that was your high school bench, right? But I was, I was doing it for reps and sets. Oh, okay. And that was the difference, but I just still didn't realize how strong I was, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would just, you know, and um, one day we were down there and we we're down there laughing and shooting the breeze, me and about four other guys. And one one of the guys said, I bet you can lift every single weight down here. <laughs> and I said, uh, probably so. And I said, uh, you know what? Put a, put it on there. You know, we're down there, cocky, arrogant. And we <laughs> added every single plate on the bar and I did it for three reps. And How much was it? 505 pounds. Oh, my God. Yeah, and we didn't add the weight up until after. So whenever they said it, it was like, man, you know it's 505 pounds? And we're like, no, re-add that weight up. It don't it don't make sense. If you would have known the number before, you never been would have been able to. I probably to do never would have tried it. I never would have no, tried yeah. it because it would have been so far out there. Even though I didn't know, you know, what how the, the difference of, of weight and and, yeah. and you know um how big of a deal that was. Um one of the counselors that is now my best friend. Uh, one of the guys had told him, they're like, hey, you know, Julius today, uh, he ripped out 505 pounds for three reps. <laughs> and he was like, do you realize that, you know, there's not a lot of people that can do that? And then he showed me some videos of C.T. Fletcher and Leroy Walker and Kevin right. LeBoke Washington. And mm -hmm. then I was blown away. Th that's where the fixation started then. Gotcha. And I was like, I want to be like those guys. Right. And, but that was in 2014. Amazing. And when, when did you get to like, uh, when did you first bench press 600? How long did that take? So I did a meet bench press 525. Um, I think that that summer. It's amazing. Then I want to say the next, the next, I want to say about eight months later, I benched six hundred pounds. That's that. That's a that's a monumental mark too, because not many guys can raw bench press six hundred pounds. Oh you know? yeah, it was blown away. I got a video of it. We're at, we're at the, we're outside under under this pavilion, and I didn't really know what I was capable of doing because still we were just doing. I was doing at the time. I wasn't training under anybody. I was right. still doing like you know pyramid sets, five by fives, mm -hmm. just stuff yeah, like a bodybuilding workout almost. Yeah, whatever information you can find on on the internet, sure. right? And uh some doing some of ct fletcher's workouts mm -hmm. which are just crazy volume sets and yeah all this <laughs> right way way too much volume yeah <laughs> stuff to like kill your cns yeah and, um, <laughs> man i showed up to this meet and i bench pressed i think it was 620 that day oh my god and that's when it was like look you need to start competing absolutely what and was the I record a, back? what was the raw bench press record back then 722 by eric's photo okay so I then, then I started. Uh, then two months later, I did a real my first real competition in Lebanon, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a pause press. And I didn't really know like you have to pause it and do all that stuff. And uh, I hit six twenty five with the pause. And soon wow. after, I started oh, I started training with Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, I think May of two thousand and fifteen, and. And that's when I was like, look, I'm going after this world record. And then it was a realization because Corel came along and broke Eric Spoto's record. Right, right. So I, I was remember. like, if I'm going to do this, I better get serious. And uh, sure. then that's when the serious training like really started. And when did you break the first break the record? What year was that? 
2019. Okay. And, and what was that record you broke? 739.6. You know, every time I've seen you break a record, I watch these videos on your Instagram, it never looks like you ever like have any trouble doing the way. It almost seems like you're you're training or something like that. Like you you're so confident and and the well, weight just I, goes up. I think the, the 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 first time I broke that world record had been probably the fourth time I've tried it. Like the oh, okay. so you were, you, were you were comfortable with the weight, yeah. So I've tried it and tried it. I think the, I don't know. There was something over me that day. It was it was probably like I I've never I've never been sure at any meet. Even still to today, whenever I was doing seven eighty two a few weeks ago, I know I know the strength is there, but not to that extent. Mm -hmm. But that day at Boss of Bosses, I knew. Put put it this way, for weeks. At a time, my daughter would ask me the same thing when I would come home from work. She would say, Daddy, when are you going to be number one? Because <laughs> at the time, I was right under Corel, And, you know, my friends would be joking. And they'd be like, oh, he's still number two. And I got videos <laughs> of my friends saying that stuff. And, um, and usually when I'm at a meet, I got my headphones in. I'm just away from everybody. And, yeah. and this time, people probably thought I was crazy because I had my headphones off and I'm talking to myself. Right. I'm, I'm like, and I, the thing that kept, kept, um, that kept saying over and over again, reiterating over and over again is, oh, today's the day. Today's the day. I got this thing. And I'm just, I don't know if I'm talking to myself or wh what's going on, but um, I just knew it that day. And sure enough, you know, I, I just kept thinking about my daughter saying, uh, hey, when are you going to be number one, dad? It, it's good to have an ego and to believe in yourself when you're in a structured, you know, type of situation. It's not good when oh, you're doing yeah. drugs and running around. So your confidence in yourself and your and your and your cockiness at a certain degree is very good for competition when it's positively directed, is what you're sharing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that day I probably could have lifted up a car. Literally, <laughs> I was so um, yeah. in tune and just, you know, I've been training. For, you know, at that point in time. Um, really training for five years yeah. and um, I just, it was just more than just, and some people look at it and they're like, oh, that's corny or whatever the case may be. But man, to be honest, bench pressing uh, the platform that I have for powerlifting is great. I love it. But man, I'm a Christian before then I'm a father to my kids before sure. then. And I'm a pillar in my community before then, you know, weightlifting is a platform for me to reach people. But um, that's all I could think about. All I could think about was, the example that I'm setting for my kids and my community. I always believe that everything we do in life is 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 a is a learning stage for where we're ultimately going. So you know, some people might see your football and your basketball as a missed opportunity. I see it as your training ground, your college, so to speak, your your educational yeah. ground to get to where you are now, which is to be the strongest bench presser in the history of the sport. Uh, you did 782 in February. You're going to be shooting, I think, for over 800 now, June 19th. Tell us about that meet that's coming up. The Chicago Cubs are sponsoring this thing. I hear there's an enormous amount of money up for this for grabs. Yes. What, how'd that uh, become come about? Uh, one of my good buddies, uh, through Ed Cohn, uh, one of his buddies uh, named Robert, um, just hooked up with him. So I think this is right before I hit the world record. Um, we were sitting at a – Ed, it was me, Ed Cohn, Josh Bryant, TD, and a couple others. Um, and Eddie Cohn, for those of you who don't know, is a is an amazing world class powerlifter, awesome guy. You know, they call him one of the greats. You yeah, know, I he, agree. He is one of the greats. And he um, basically he was he was late to the meeting, but we were eating at a Fogo de Chao in in Chicago. Oh, I love that place. Yeah. And he was like, "I got a buddy that's gonna meet you there first and. Um, don't be intimidated by him. He, and he, you know, he's being funny and saying it's an old bald guy with a track suit on. And we go up to this, you know, the, we get there and there's a guy sitting at the bar, old bald guy with a track suit on. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're hanging out. Then we're, then Ed comes and we're sitting at this table and we're, you know, they're drinking and having a good time. I don't drink. So we're just talking about different, you know, the history of the sport and, you know, and, um, Ed growing up and, you know, Ed's accomplishments. And the question came up and said, have you ever thought about bench pressing 800 pounds? And I was like, absolutely not. You know, I ain't even broke the record yet. And um, at the time, my brother, 
my brother, he's more of a um, endurance type of guy. So he he trains. He, he's a trainer, but he trains for you know just endurance and and just to be able to run and 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 you know just to have a lot of stamina. Anyway, stamina. But um, so my brother would always pose the question, but I I would just kind of blow it off like, man, he's crazy. Then this guy asked me the same question. And he's like, what would it take for you to go for 800 pounds? And I was like, I mean, uh, you understand the magnitude. I haven't even broke the world record yet. But 800 pounds is basically like saying, all right, we're going to take this space shuttle to Saturn. <laughs> and, get back to the <laughs> and, um, and I'm looking at Ed, and he's like, you know, uh, we're, we're all kind of get, get everything gets quiet. And he's like, look. If you hit 800 pounds, I'll give you 100 grand. Wow. And then I look back at Ed and I'm like, this guy's drunk, is what I'm saying. <laughs> You're like, 100 grand, I'll do I'll do 900 for 100 grand. Dude. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's crazy because powerlifters don't see this type of money, period. No, flat no one does. Yeah, no, flat no. out. Uh, very rarely do do bodybuilders see this money unless they're the elite, elite. Yeah. And, um, so I got the wheel spinning and I looked at Ed and Ed's like, look, he's definitely got the money. And from there, um, you know, we had a deal. He said, look, you, you hit 800 pounds. I'll give you a hundred grand. Wow. So from there kind of conspire, I mean, you know, through the, the, the last experience I had on ESPN with, um, the strongman organization, um, core sports. Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with those guys? Yeah. Um, with them and, um it didn't turn out you know it was a lot of stuff behind the scenes that didn't turn out the way it was supposed to turn out basically got gypped and i got misloaded and um through that experience um is what brought us to the wrigley field event so what what happened at course that core sports event what were you promised something that you weren't given oh absolutely absolutely what were you promised? They, they talked about payout was supposed to be anywhere from um 80 to 100 grand through sponsorships and things like that and they didn't come up with the money absolutely not did you get anything uh my hotel reimbursed oh my god That's terrible in fact i lost money <laughs> but uh it's a lesson learned you, you know, live and learn yeah yeah where people are like you know um we can't discuss potential sponsors until you sign the contract and they sign the yeah. contract and basically uh, they bombarded the event, took over the whole event, and um, they got their clout, whatever the case may be, and didn't, sure. uh, you know, try to come up with an excuse why they couldn't pay up. And uh, so, but, you know, through that was one of those experiences where you live and you learn, and now you see where we're at, you know, yeah. the opportunity that I have today. That is awesome. So Wrigley Field, June 19th, you're going to be going for I, – I asked him before. I said, you're going to go for 800? He's like, oh, I'm going for more than 800. What, what, do you, what, do you, what would you like to hit at that meet? 805, 810, 815. Um, nice. You know, you set your goals and aim, aim higher. So what let – me, let me ask you a question because I, I, the only thing I can equate this to because I, I, I was at a decent bench. I bench 500, but I never really – I can't really equate it to that. But when I would squat and I would get under 700 pounds – just moving, back, walking back with the weight. I felt the crushing aspect of that weight on my back, but I always knew if worst comes to worst, I could dump it. When you get under a bench press and you take that kind of weight off, in your just the pressure on your hands alone, what is what does eight hundred feel like? I mean, can you can you equate it to anything else that you could explain to people so they can get a concept in their mind of what that feels like? I don't think there's anything you can compare it to, you know. Yeah. It's it's nuts. I just just know this. Literally the the day of and the day after the event my body is so run down that I feel like I got hit by a car. I have to imagine it's probably traumatic to your nervous system too. It's so. literally like you, you have the flu for 2 <laughs> days, 2 to 3 days. I'm glad but you if I could equate anything to that. It's almost like a isometric press. Well, you're pressing against a force that is immovable, <laughs> and it's just like you're doing everything you can right. to press this weight off your chest. That's right. probably the only comparison that I can compare it to mm -hmm. is, is 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 something like that. Because I mean, you think about it: what other position will we ever be in that position to have to? You know what I mean? 
Yeah. So like, it's, unless it's, you have a car on top of you, I don't think that you're going to be uh, in that situation absolutely. at all. Absolutely. Well, who is your great? Who is your greatest um, powerlifting bench press mentor? The person who made the the biggest impact on how you lift and your success? Would you say? Uh, I would say Josh Bryant and uh, my buddy Josh that start that got me into powerlifting. Okay. That, that you know, so two people: Josh Bryant, Josh Patterson. So, yeah. actually, my buddy Josh Patterson was the, one of the. He was one of the uh, um, one of the 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 not a mentor, but one of the um, one of the staff members at the facility that I was at. I guess and he's the one that was like, "Hey, look, uh, you know, maybe you should start powerlifting." <laughs> and he became my training partner and traveling partner, um, you know, for the next you know three years, and mm-hmm. had kind of helped me stay inbound. And 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 he's the one that reached out to Josh Bryant. Gotcha. To start coaching me. Gotcha. So, yeah, when you talk to Josh and you sit down with him, you talk, you know, what the future and strategy, what does Josh think you're capable of? What do you think you're capable of? of oh, from that? day one, from day one, Josh was like, you're going to break this all time world record. Well, you've already done that, but I'm saying now moving forward, can you do 900? I mean, is that a possibility? I mean, at this point, we don't know. We don't know what, what the potential is. Mm-hmm. Like I've been no one in the history of the sport has ever even come close to lifting what you do. So you're so far ahead of everyone else that it's like, I, I you know, I, I, where's the limit? I don't know. We're, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're paving the way. We're in yeah. uncharted waters that no one has ever been. No one has ever thought that the body could even uh, withhold something that is so to this magnitude. Like, no yeah. one has ever even thought about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and with Josh's um, training methods, and you know my gifts, it's almost like this, 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 this talent is is basically we still. I don't even. To, if you want to get all the way transparent, yeah, I think, I think that nine hundred pounds is very um, attainable or achievable. Wow, that's great. I really do, I, I, simply because I know that with everything going on and the training over the past five years that I've done, I've done it under madness. Meaning uh, at one point I had basically three jobs. Oh boy. Um, I have four kids at home. Oh my God. Doing all that. I, I got like, three. I th- I'm going crazy. I can't even imagine. Oh, I have four kids, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, I didn't start training um, solely for bench press and dedicating everything for bench press until February of 2020. Oh, so I've been doing this a year, basically. That's crazy. Yeah. I've been doing this a year without uh, having a full-time job. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And look, look at how far we've, we've brought it, you know? What do you weigh? Right now I'm, I'm at 443. (laughs) (laughs) What do you, you you know, it's funny because whenever I ask people this, I always, I'm always getting, uh, I always get, uh, burned by the question because not, not everyone eats a lot do you have to eat a lot of food to sustain that or are you just a guy that grows you know man, it, man I, to be honest i don't eat a lot of food man i, I, I knew you're gonna say i knew you're gonna say that i knew you're a free genetic freak. crazy um <laughs> justin harris is my d- nutritionist okay with Trooper nutrition and yeah, he knows what he's doing, yeah you know um he he does my meal plans and and yeah, he'll tell you that he had me eating like eight meals a day. Right. And literally food was coming out of my nose. You probably weren't even eating at all. You were probably eating half of that. I bet you. Was, I, I, for the first two <laughs> weeks, I was eating everything because I wanted it that bad. Right. Then I, I came to, because like I was so lethargic in my workouts. Sure. Because I just stayed full all the time. I was miserable. Yeah. And he, we kind of doubted back. But uh, my, I, I don't know. I just... You know, between, you know, my supplements and uh, which I'm open about that, mm. I just like I didn't start taking testosterone until 2000 and what was it? 2019. Oh, so that's why you're still growing so well, because you're so your receptors are so good. What, so, how much testosterone do you need to take for, for powerlifting purposes? Uh, for In the beginning, I wasn't taking any. I hit a 716 pound bench in 2019. Oh, my God. And my, we. Uh, my testosterone levels were under 300. <laughs> yeah. So much, for, so much for the fact that you need high testosterone to be strong, right? I know, right? Well, people didn't believe me anyway. So, like, right. I went through this episode where, and it was due to probably my testosterone levels were so low, my hormones were out of whack. 
Yeah. But in December of 2018, I had a basically a mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. And it's because, you know, I'm working a full time job, two part time jobs. Right. And uh, whenever I had any open time, I'm, I'm doing moving jobs. Oh. You know, I went from I'm playing catch up, you know, at this point in time. Sure. Because I didn't have a full time. It was, it was a, at the age of 26 was the first time I've ever held a full time job. Yeah. So um, I, I hated. I just didn't understand how people would get up and go to work every day. I never. The only person I've seen in my in my household that would get up and go to work is my mom. Right. You know. So I thought men, you know, laid around and live life how they wanted to live. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's, and so. that's not how it works. So once, you know, it's crazy because I had a, I didn't have a desire to work, and the switch flipped, and it was like whatever I can do to make a living, an honest living, I'm gonna do it. So. Yeah. But eventually that comes to a head and it came to a head in 2018, partly because, you know, my hormones were off, but I was literally, I would go to the gym and work out and half of my workouts, I would be crying through the whole, through, uh, through, the, through the half of the workouts. You were working yourself to death basically is what you yeah, were doing. Basically. Yeah, basically, you know, from, you know, working out, then kids and then work my job. And then not sleeping, I'm sure too, on top yeah, of that. I was getting averaging about five to six hours of sleep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. um, and you know, um, my bo- I went through a, a period where my body was just breaking down, and it just nothing felt right, and I was just right. depressed, and um, I wanted to give up. I was about to give up powerlifting. I reached out to Josh Bryant, and I said, "Josh, I'm going crazy. I don't know. You know, my dad had just died uh, about a year and a half later. I mean, a year and a half earlier. About a year earlier, my dad died. A year and a half earlier, my dad died." And I was just mentally uh, beat down. And Josh said, have you got your blood work taken? And I'm like, why would I need my blood work taken? He said, go get your blood work taken. Let's see if your hormones and, and your levels are where they're at. And sure enough, I went and my, my testosterone levels were under 300. Everything else was no, pretty much normal for being a big guy. Right. Besides my testosterone levels. And my estrogen was up. And um, it took me about two months to fully commit to um you know being on testosterone Mm -hmm. simply because you know uh, i did want to compete in drug free um into drug free uh power lifting but man i realized that uh if i don't start you know treating my body the way it needs to be treated and 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 getting the the supplements that i need in then i won't be as good as anything you know so um got on and i you know saw saw it uh, you know, um, out to some of my mentors and, and, you know, they agreed and said that, Hey, look, you know, this is probably what you need to do. And then, uh, you know, it, it was, it was, it was from then on, it was game time, you know, right. it just, I felt so what is, like, what does a guy like your size have to do with testosterone wise to get yourself in the right, you know, level to get the strength that you need and the recovery and all that stuff right now? Uh, I'm at, um, 300 megs. Okay, so you're taking like a replacement dose of testosterone every week. Yeah. Do you take anything more than that, or is that that, nope. that it? That's it. Okay. No so other- just restoring your testosterone to a high normal is, is enough for you, is what you're That's saying. It. That's it. People, wow. Even whenever I told, even a long time ago, when people I told people that I wasn't on testosterone, um, people didn't believe me. Why? Well, yeah, no one believes anyone who does anything spectacular like that. But would you so, ever take a, a? Would you ever try to do more stuff to try to like to bring it to the next level? If you well, hit a plateau, never, I don't know. so I'm already 435, 445 <laughs> pounds. So I don't. I'm uh, one is I'm uneducated in those supplements. Yeah. And two, um, I I want to have longevity in the sport. Yeah, I guess I don't want my body breaking down, and I don't know what kind of harm. Mm. Those supplements would do, and you body. obviously don't need it. So yeah. you're the world record holder. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, and I've always been one of those guys. You know, since I've been saved and been walking down this path, that I'm not going to compromise. Is in right. I don't want to take a chance in you know having any illegal supplements and then getting busted right. for right. You know, right. this is and this is a prescription you have. I understand. So that, that's yeah. smart. So, um, I do everything by the books and. Mm. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I've thought about it, you know, uh, because it, the, the, the amount of work that I get in from my workouts 
my body stays trashed. Yeah. It just yeah, not recovering me. probably, but the level that someone who would be doing full blown cycles probably would be doing. And even even where with with the supplements that I'm on now, like yeah. my body does not, you know, it like for example, I bench pressed last Monday, and I'm finally, and I, I've completed my full week of uh, programming, but my body is finally. Uh, back to its normal state to where I can probably go do another workout. So you need to take sometimes extra time off to recover. Which Absolutely. Is, which Absolutely. is smart. I mean, some guys would try to push through it, and that's obviously how you get injured, you know. I've learned I've learned that because that, at one point I was benching two times a week heavy. Too much. And it, it just didn't work out. My yeah. body didn't respond well. I just mm. stayed to where um, I kept getting injuries every three to four weeks. and. Mm -hmm. We found that dialing it back and benching every heavy every 10 days for me, when it's above 85, 90%, um, I have to bench every, you know, 10 to 14 days. Look, you got to read your body and you did that. And that's smart. That It's not dumb. It's smart to because to, to, everyone's body recovers at a different rate. I was a slow recovery guy too. I would I would train my whole body every eight, eight days. And I know guys that were doing like Ronnie Coleman double, you know, two body parts, you know, they would do the same body part twice a week. I don't know how they recovered, but everyone recovers differently. You know, yeah. just, I mean, but then again, are they really reducing mileage for longevity in the sport? Maybe because not. The, yeah, maybe not. Right. Right. You know, we're, we're allotted a certain amount of time to be able to, you know, um, push our bodies to that limit. But eventually something is going to give. Yeah. Would so, you ever do a, would you ever do an equipped bench? No. Nah. No, no one, no desire. Mm -hmm. As I mean, to me, I, I have a, a few equipped uh, benches that are my friends, but to me, it's like dunking a basketball off of a trampoline. It's <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm sure if someone came up with enough money, you probably would do it. Yeah, probably. It, it would have to be a whole <laughs> lot of money, a whole lot of money. But uh, I just, I'm not knocking anybody, yeah. but I, I kind of have a pet peeve. Anytime you, 90% of the time, whenever you ask equipped lifters how much you bench press, they will tell you how much they bench press, but they won't tell you that it's equipped. Right. So a lot of the information is misled because you mm -hmm. know how many times a day that I see messages of people saying, you don't hold the world record in bench press. <laughs> Even before I held the world record, Yeah. people would still say that that's not the world record whenever Carell mm -hmm. had it. They would right. say the quick record is, uh, or I know a guy that benches 1,100 pounds, and I'm like, but you know what? Those guys that do bench that much weight, they will tell you right off the bat. They don't. They don't try to portray it as anything that it's not. They always say equip. It's the friends of them that tell everyone that it's. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's true. That's true. So anyway, um, I want to just you know thank you for joining me. I also want to wish you the best of luck on June nineteenth. I'd love. To, I, I'm I'm as excited as 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 any other fan out there. I want to see you break that eight hundred because I never thought in my lifetime that I would see anyone bench press that much weight. Um, because no one was even close to it. And uh, you're, uh, I'm glad that you've embraced your gifts. You've overcome your demons. And uh, you're a great role model for, for young men and women out there that basically says, hey, it's never too late to become the, the person that you're supposed to become. Absolutely. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Julius. And uh, right. I appreciate you joining us. And guys, that's going to – you want to thank your sponsors at all? Absolutely. Shout out okay. to um, Ghost Strong, Ghost Strong Equipment, MHP, um, Evolve Company, Inc., um, and uh, Hustle Butter. What's Hustle Butter? So Hustle Butter is a uh, topical that helps with recovery. Cool. So it's a CBD, Hustle Butter CBD. And um, I kid you not, I've always been, I'm a skeptical when it, a skeptic when it comes to stuff like that. Right. And uh, you know what? I can't tell you how many people have tried this product and said, man, this stuff works. It like it literally it really works. I got to give um, it a shot. Sounds oh, good. absolutely. You, you shoot me some. Shoot me your P.O. box and I'll get you some out. Oh, box. cool. All right. I'll send you a little gift box after when we get off. We'll exchange addresses. All right. All right, guys. Uh, that's going to take us to the end of another episode of Live With. I'm Dave Palumbo with Julius Maddox. We'll see you next time.